So, uh, so Lisa. Okay. Can you see that it come so, up about the recording? Yeah. Uh, no. So, right. Uh, I've I've clicked the um, okay or whatever. So, uh, so Lisa, I'll just uh, mention that uh, you know so at, uh, after asking the question, perhaps I'll also uh, uh, put my video off uh, when I'm not talking because you know there could be some uh, connectivity issues at my end. So just to avoid that, uh, I'll uh, when uh, you know when you are talking, I might just switch off my uh, video if okay. if the connection uh, shows uh, some error or something like. That. Okay. Uh, so so i'll just start so you, you are the first uh, person of indian origin uh, in the, you know to have been a part of uh, to have been elected to the australian parliament which is uh, a big thing so if you can uh, you know talk a little about the challenges that you faced and uh, you know you certainly broke a glass ceiling over there so if you can you know talk a little bit and also about perhaps in what way your Indian heritage may have, uh, you know, sort of helped or what you may have got from there, from your roots. So just uh, share something about your journey. Look, I, I was really quite shocked to find out um, when I joined the Australian Parliament, uh, the Australian Senate in 2011, that I was the first person uh, of Indian origin in, in our Australian Parliament. Um, I was shocked because I knew that we had a very vibrant and growing Indian diaspora in Australia, as well as a number of uh, second and third generation um, uh, people of Indian origin living in Australia. In fact, I, at the moment, our, um, there's over 700,000 people of Indian origin, the fastest growing here in Australia. And, you know, that's rapidly increased over the past two decades, some 20 fold. So, you know, because they are the largest source of permanent migrants, uh, made up of skilled professionals, uh, all sorts of people, I would have thought there would have been more representation in our Australian Parliament. So that was a, a little bit of, of a shock, but at the same time, I saw it as being a woman of Indian heritage. Um, you know, I, I guess it meant for me, I, I was definitely part of a minority in the Australian Parliament. But I didn't let that challenge become an issue. Uh, I think the fact that I was pre-selected and the people elected me into parliament is an example of how society is changing and wants to see more diverse people representing them, you know, so that our, our democracy is representative of our broader Australian society. As you know, Australia is a multicultural society and its democratic institutions really need to reflect that in, in its makeup. And I think for me, um, you know, in a way, I've had to break through two glass ceilings, really. Uh, the mm. fact is, as a woman, uh, and a woman from a culturally diverse background, we are not yet seen as a critical mass. And I think my first experience of that was growing up in one of the least culturally diverse Australian states in the country, and that's Tasmania. I think at the time when I was growing up, you could fit most of the Indian community uh, into one family home. <laughs> and that, that, that often happened. Um, you know, I, I, didn't, I did not really have a concept of my own cultural identity growing up externally. I only had it internally, you know, when I spent time at home, you know, with my dad, learning about that part of, of my Indian, you know, cultural identity. So because it's hard to, to be what you can't see, growing up, uh, I wanted to be more Australian in a way and less Indian. Um, I, you know, I was in a sense denying half of my, my own heritage. Um, but in terms of being a young woman, and whilst I went to an all girls school, um, you know, it, it took a while to really learn that, uh, you know, to, to have that sort of courage to stand for leadership roles, um, you know, to, to look at the sorts of ways in which I could contribute to, to my, my society. And I think, you know, this was in the 1980s. A lot has changed since then uh, across Australia, uh, thanks to uh, a number of female trail, trailblazers who have made that path easier 
uh, for us women here in Australia and also women of diverse backgrounds. And I think today that, you know, we are more of a diverse and in inclusive country here in Australia, uh, thanks to migrants settling outside of major capital cities. So, you know, for me, I think in terms of entering the Australian Senate, when it came to these sorts of leadership roles that I stood, stood, you know, stood for, I was often the only person of colour in the room. Uh, there was very little or no recognition of cultural diversity in leadership roles in the, in the sorts of advocacy or political systems that I belong to. And so, you know, those sorts of attitudes on race and prejudice for me, I think really, you know, played out very much in my very first election campaign in 2006. Uh, I remember having my, my posters for my election, um, well, defaced in a way. I know that happens to a range of candidates. For me, it came in the form of red dots being placed on my forehead across all of my posters. Okay. Um, and, you know, I had another candidate who was running against me, knocking on doors, encouraging people not to vote for me as I wouldn't get elected anyway, because I am of Indian origin. So, you know, these are some of the, some of the challenges that one experiences when you put yourself forward for election uh, that, you know, doesn't make politics uh, easy. And it certainly teaches you to start having a bit of a thick skin along that journey. But despite all of that, I did not let any of it waver my resolve of what I knew that I could bring to the political stage. Yeah, and it just made it that little bit more important that, that I did stand and, you know, and, and work that little bit harder. And what played out is, you know, five elections, uh, 12 years in, in parliament, um, where people elected me for who I was, um, you know, ahead of the, I will say, the racist candidate who lost. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it also gave me incredible faith in my community that they themselves wanted greater diversity, that despite the lack of cultural diversity in the Australian Parliament, uh, I was not living in a racist community. Uh, as a young woman, you know, I, I didn't experience very much prejudice, uh, but I think that is because women in politics now have become more of a critical mass. There are simply more of us and that visibility really breaks down barriers. So uh, it, I know, I mean, you did talk a little bit about, uh, you know, going back to where you are originally come from, but if you could also step back a little and talk about, uh, you know, T Tasmania and how you first, uh, I mean, sort of, uh, why did you kind of decide to, uh, you know, sort of become a, a, a enter public life and politics and, uh, uh, you know, yeah. what what inspired you in a sense? Yeah. Well, in a way, um, you know, within my own family, I, I've grown up with an incredible role model as, of my grandfather. Um, so Ram Jadi Singh, OBE, was a member of parliament in the Fiji parliament. Um, okay. And really, really, this is in the 1960s and 70s, at a time when, you know, Fiji was still under British rule. He, he very much pushed for um, Fiji's independence from Britain. Um, and he sought the support, along with the Prime Minister of Fiji, they both sought the support of the then Indian Prime Minister, Indira Gandhi, in terms of India's freedom struggle, what India had gone through, and what Fiji could learn from that. So from a very young age, I learned of this sort of um, courageous advocacy uh, in, the, in the democratic space of a small island state, one which had a very vibrant and uh, you know, long, long history in terms of India and its diaspora. And I learned about my great grandfather from him as well, which, who obviously was an indentured labourer from, from India, left Gwalior as a young man in, in, when he was 19 uh, to board a, a, a vessel in Calcutta and travel on a month long journey to, to help the British build their, their sugarcane um, you know, empire, uh, not knowing the treacherous journey or the treacherous conditions, slave-like conditions that he would be uh, enduring whilst in Fiji. So I guess those, those stories of struggle, uh, of you know, fighting for, for justice and for freedom is something that, that I grew up with. And in a way, mm -hmm. 
I think indirectly it helped shape the sorts of advocacy roles that I wanted to participate in within my own community. But, you know, the date that the year I was born was actually the year that the white Australia policy came to an end. So, you know, 1972, it wasn't that that long ago. Uh, so, you know, before that, you know, we've have we have had this sort of history in this country of uh, um, a lack of acceptance of, of others. Uh, you know, it's only now, what, 49 years since that policy has ended. So by the time uh, I was elected to the Australian, to the Tasmanian parliament, um, I was the only member of parliament from, you know, Indian background. Um, and when I then moved to the Australian parliament, I was only one of four parliamentarians in, in total of, of, of an Asian uh, background. So clearly this needs to change. But my journey really was that I felt, um, you know, I had something to contribute to the democratic system. Um, you know, it, it was really about um, having, having a, a sense of self-worth and, and ideas for policy change. One of those, of course, was wanting more stronger cultural diverse mm -hmm. representation across all aspects of leadership in Australian society, be it be it the political system or the non-government areas or, or government or, or business. Um, and now in my role with the Australian Indie Institute, yes. um, you know, obviously continuing yeah. that across all of yes. those different pillars. Um, you know, it, our democratic system is one, but this business, of course, plays a, an important role too. And, um, you know, as I said before, you can't be what you can't see. And I think uh, uh, our CEOs, our politicians, uh, yeah, our leaders in our in our multicultural country have an important role to play to encourage the next generation of of Indian Australians of, of people of of different backgrounds to to know that they have that opportunity that freedom uh, to to come forward and, and contribute to Australian society and in that contribute their own cultural diversity. You know, it's something very unique to to carry that to carry that understanding of different culture while still living within the broader Australian community. Right. Uh, so uh, you just mentioned about your current role. Uh, so now you are a, you know, a champion for uh, Indo-Australian uh, you know, relations to take it to the next level. So if you can talk a little bit about your present role, also what are some of the challenges or roadblocks which you see can be overcome in the coming years uh, and that you're working towards? Uh... Look, I think the, the once uh, on again, off again, Australia-India relationship is now definitely on. Um, I, I think that in terms of security and foreign policy terms, I think 2021 should definitely be remembered as the year that the Australia-India relationship soared to unthinkable new heights. And there's undoubtedly long-term gains to be had between both of our countries that stem from obviously our shared norms of wanting to create peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, there's the uplift of, of maritime security from both sides, uh, from India inviting Australia to be part of the Malabar exercises to Australia inviting India to join uh, the next talisman sabre exercises, all leads to a stronger geopolitical partnership for 2022 and beyond. But the elevation of the Australia-India relationship, I think, to a comprehensive strategic partnership and the commitments to obviously both countries to a rules-based international order cannot ignore the ongoing challenges, I think, that still exist for both of our countries brought about by, by the COVID-19 pandemic and that are continuing to play out as we speak in terms of this next variant of Omicron here in Australia, but also now starting to rise in India. But I think also Australia can't uh, ignore the sort of, you know, what, what has occurred through the virus, through, through the pandemic over the past year, you know, in terms of a public diplomacy sense, the fallout that was caused by the temporary travel ban for Indians in May, which prevented you know, a number of Indian students being able to return here to Australia to complete their university studies. And, and also the Indian diaspora's frustrations here 
that their children, family were stranded in India and they, they couldn't connect and be with them as that as the Delta variant ravaged uh, at that time. So, you know, I think it's been tough for, for some of our Indian diaspora here. I think it's been tough for Indian students. But I do think Australia will bounce back with, a, with an increase in, in Indian students studying in Australia if the right policy settings are in place. And I think that's where for me and for the Institute, we can play an important role. We need to play a role in ensuring with, that we you know, provide the necessary research, that we provide the policy advice to both governments to ensure that those those new settings that is going to continue to make the relationship so vibrant into 2022 are in place. And that's where we, we have a number of academics, we have a number of experts that contribute. This is a very significant year, of course, for India, being the 75th anniversary year of its independence. And so for the Institute, we want to play a really, really important role in that, both here from Australia, but also in India itself. Yeah, you uh, spoke about students. I was, uh, you know, uh, going, I was, that was going to be one of my questions. So, uh, you know, you did mention about how a lot of students faced hardships because they couldn't either join classes or go back, or for that matter, come back to India. I mean, many of them were stuck um, in at campuses in Sydney, Melbourne, other cities as well. So, uh, you know, the, uh, students and, and not just students but even young professionals many of them may have you know come from the pool of students and then stayed back and got jobs or you know doing internship uh, this whole community of indians uh, in australia they fa they faced a lot of hardship in uh, you know uh, since the pandemic and um, you know one um, one has seen in certain groups or one has heard while reporting you know about uh, you know the various things um, health health issues uh, uh, buying medicine even food sometimes it's been a challenging time because jobs have also you know gone, uh, gone away and things like that so any efforts um, uh, you know on your part or any groups that you know of which are supporting people like that uh, you know the indian diaspora who may not be uh, who are just uh, you know, not even Australians yet, but living there, working there, or students there, um, to reach out to them. Yeah, look, it has been incredibly tough for Indian students during the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I do hope that uh, uh, Australia will bounce back as a destination country for Indian students once those right policy settings are put in place. I think the International Student Arrivals Plan that was put in place has started to welcome students to Australia since December. Um, you know, this effort of welcome needs to be pushed and it needs to continue into 2022. For example, uh, in, in Melbourne, we have the study Melbourne Hubs, which was established as a way to ensure this can happen, to provide that offshore support and promote Victoria as a study destinations. But, you know, whilst we have restrictions that have now lifted, I think Australia must think very carefully before imposing such restrictions again that were found to cause really negative feelings towards Australia and also have long lasting impacts on how Indians view Australia, both living here, studying here in Australia. It was an incredibly difficult time. I know that there, were, there was support provided through, through the Victorian government, uh, even our own uh, institute, we provide bursaries for uh, struggling Indian students. But, you know, it, it was still a very, very difficult time for, for students during this. And as you say, a number of them were unable to work. Lockdowns were extended for such a long period that made it very, very, very difficult. So this sort of fortress Australia that happened last year, particularly the travel ban to India, has had very negative effect on the, on the diaspora and students stranded in India. It didn't recognize the bilateral social connections between our two countries. So, you know, many Australians have deep connections to countries, you know, in the world and Indian Australians are a large proportion of that. And it also made Australia appear very, very insular. You know, it was very upsetting for the Indian community. <clears throat> and I think when you have nearly, well, this is a country where you have nearly 
30% of the population born overseas. Being unable to physically connect with family is so hard. But the emergency relief fund uh, provided by the Victorian government for Indian students was a really positive step. And I think we, we probably need to do some research and learn from these experiences to see how, hopefully it won't happen again, but if it does happen again, how we can support our international students a lot better than we did. Uh, so, um, uh, sort of um, uh, moving a little bit to uh, to a more uh, personal question. So, you um, do you follow like Indian traditions at home? Do you speak any Indian language, or I mean, how do you associate with India? Uh, sort of, you know, if you can yeah. talk a little about that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I follow many Indian traditions. I mean, I guess for me, it's, you know, it was part of growing up to, to, to celebrate Diwali, to, to light candles out the side, the front of our home, uh, to celebrate Holly and be covered in all sorts of, of, of colourful powder. Uh, my father, you know, brushing me and me him. Um, but also other Indian festivals like Navratri, um, I'm also learning Hindi again. I'll say again because it's been a stop start, uh, <laughs> stop start language journey for me. Um, but I'm hoping that uh, through uh, the teaching that I've had here uh, at the, the Hindi school, the IABVA Hindi school here in Sydney, that I'll be able to put that in practice when I travel to India in the coming month or two. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's an ongoing improvement, my Hindi, let's put it that way. But I think in terms of cultural understanding, very much been a part of growing up, but also being very much a part of being uh, in, in public life, being a politician, because is not one Indian uh, community or, or, or different, um, different group that would want me to be part of their cultural festival and attend uh, their, their events all across the country. Of course, Australia is such a big country, I could never get to everything. But you, suffice to say, it's always, you know, it's an uplifting experience because it's not only just about uh, that part of the Indian diaspora celebrating that particular Indian festival, it's actually about including the broader Australian community. And that's what really increases India literacy that makes them understand who, who are these Indians that are living uh, within Australia? What's their contribution? What's their cultural understanding? Uh, I think more needs to happen in that space though. I think particularly at the business level, what I've learned since I've been at the Institute is, uh, you know, both in terms of government and business, there's still a lack of, of real deep India literacy. Uh, it needs to move beyond the sort of, you know, the three C's of Commonwealth, Curry and Cricket. We need to understand each other a lot more. And it's the same on the India side, I'm sure, that they need to understand Australia a lot more, that we are no, you know, we're no longer a country with a white Australia policy. We are a vibrant multicultural community that, you know, allows for freedom of expression and allows for that cultural understanding whilst being part of the broader Australian value set. But yeah, I've, I, I always enjoy, in fact, the AII, uh, the Australian Indian Institute has a, uh, a, a sort of Indian cultural calendar that we follow quite, quite closely to ensure we, we never miss one of, one of the upcoming Indian festivals or events that, that may be taking place. So what about Bollywood? <laughs> I mean, do you watch well, look, you know, you know, I had the privilege um, um, a few years ago of of visiting Amitabh Bachchan in, in Mumbai at his home. It was a oh, very, wow. very, very special day. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, obviously, we talked not just about his incredible. Uh, acting uh, history in India, but also his contribution to Australian film. Uh, he was part of The Great Gatsby, which was, you know, produced by Baz Luhrmann. He spent a, a bit of time here in Australia uh, on that. Okay. And we, sh we shared all sorts of ideas about opportunities for Amitabh Bachchan okay. to come to Australia <laughs> again and, uh, you know, light up the Indian diaspora here. But 
beyond him, I, I love Indian film, be it Bollywood or, or otherwise. We have a vibrant um, Indian film, Melbourne Indian Film Festival here, mm -hmm. uh, that, which always puts on a, a huge show of films. Of course, last year that had to go online, uh, but usually it has a Bollywood star like Ashwari Rai or someone coming out, which is all, always very exciting. I get very excited by Bollywood. But having said that, I'm not the best Bollywood dancer. <laughs> That's perhaps something I need lessons in, like my Hindi. <laughs> Bollywood dancing, yeah. Uh, so uh, you mentioned about visiting India soon. How often do you visit India? And is it always on work? Or have you, you know, been on any trip where you try to connect with your roots in some way? Or do you at all have any family who you've tried to engage with or I understand that in your case it's a different kind of a you know diasporic uh, connection but nevertheless uh... very much I mean I think you know prior to the pandemic I did visit India often um, and I do look forward to traveling to India in the next month um, COVID of course has made it very difficult for, for travel uh, between our two countries but my connections are usually work related, uh, either when I was in politics. Uh, of course, one of the most special trips I ever made to India was to receive the Pravasi Bratia Saman uh, in 2015 in, in Daninagar in uh, Gujarat. Um, that was an incredible honour to, to not only to receive that award for building friendly relations between Australia and India, but also then to be, you know, sort of um, opened up to um, having lunch with Prime Minister Modi ji and, and so many other uh, ministers, um, you know, to share sort of um, my views on India, their views on Australia, to build that connection between both of our countries. But my other trips, I think my very first trip, like so many Australians, uh, was, was a you know, complete cultural backpacking trip all across Rajasthan. And, uh, you know, but I think since that time, I have become more interested in my own family heritage, my own family journey and connections to India. So one of the most significant trips I made was in 2018. So I had the opportunity to visit uh, Kolkata, I went to uh, the Kidapur port from where my great grandparents left India. There is now a memorial built there in honour of the thousands of Gimitias who sailed from India for a better life. I have a copy of my great grandfather's emigration pass, and that, you know, it, it shows obviously where he originated from in Gwalior and Madhya Pradesh, uh, but it also shows so much information about him, his age, his height, um, you know, um, yeah, the, the, the incredible journey that uh, so many left that port. And it was a very eerie moment to stand, you know, on the banks of the Hooghly River and, uh, you know, to, to be part of this, this environment with all of the barracks and all of the ship memorabilia still remaining. To, and to see written, you know, in, 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 it was written in Punjabi, in Hindi, in English, in Bengali, uh, these words that described, um, you know, the, the respect given to all of those gimmicks that left that place. So my, you know, my, my sort of uh, uh, calling or um, certain interest in, in my own family heritage continues to grow. So perhaps on my next trip, I'll get to visit Gwalior where, where my family came from. But, um, you know, in terms of um, connecting with, with relatives from distant past in that sense, I think I'll need my father to come with me. <laughs> right. So um, you, you mentioned it, uh, you know, uh, earlier uh, uh, while we were speaking about the fact that, you know, you are one, uh, uh, you were the first uh, person of Indian origin in the parliament and, uh, again, in where you started in Tasmania, you were probably, as you mentioned, very small Indian community. Uh, you know, in um, in countries like Canada, the U.S., uh, growing increasingly in the U.S., U U.K., there are so many people of Indian origin in public life, in parliament, in government. Uh, you know, the uh, President Biden, uh, his team of Indians uh, is growing every day. I mean, I think it's uh, triple digit now. So 
so uh, do you uh, you know do you see uh, more young people of indian origin in australia as well uh, slowly moving towards you know roles in public life or even uh, getting into politics uh, and do you feel the need to mentor such people do you get an opportunity to interact with them and uh, um, is that happening at all look i think the experience of of the us and canada and the uk is something that australia needs to bottle up it really needs to learn from what uh, those the, particularly those three countries how they have in, enabled the Indian diaspora to rise up to such important leadership levels. It's something that you don't see so much here in Australia. I think we still have a long way to go. Suffice to say, our diaspora in Australia is a lot, uh, well, you know, newer in that sense. I mean, I think there's been migration to the United States since the early 80s. For Australia, it's really happened only in the last two decades, you know, to the, to the large extent that we currently have it. But having said that, you know, that there, there are policies and mechanisms I know that some of those other countries put in place at the time to ensure that barriers weren't there for their, for their newly arrived Indian migrants. And I think that's something that we need to learn here in Australia, because to be honest, I don't see a lot of younger Indian Australians coming forward in political life. You see it more at the local government level, you know, at the council level, and that is a level that I have provided that mentorship and support. But in terms of the Australian parliament, the federal parliament level, it is still very much lacking. And it's not just lacking in terms of uh, people of Indian origin, it's across the whole sort of Asia Pacific uh, diaspora makeup. And I think that needs to change. And uh, I think, you know, our major political parties, both of them here in Australia, uh, have a role to play here, you know, really need to see how did those other countries ensure there is such in, such representation that they have today. I think the Biden administration is to be really commended in that sense. Uh, you know, obviously Kamala Harris is an incredible role model for so many of us uh, women of Indian origin, but uh, there are so many others as well in the, in the Biden administration. So, you know, there's a lot more work to be done here. Um, I think, you know, that sort of untapping of the Indian diaspora in Australia is a whole body of work that needs to happen both at the government and business level. Uh, and it needs to be sort of, you know, gender balanced in its makeup as well. You know, we've had a lot of policy development work happen here in Australia over the past few years. One of those is, is the India Economic Strategy, which was authored by Peter Varghese, AO. He was once the, the, the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and before that he was High Commissioner, Australian High Commissioner to India. He, he made it very clear in his India economic strategy that it is the Indian diaspora that are the biggest economic asset for uh, uh, the Australia-India relationship. So I think if we are to take that seriously, we really need to be investing more into leadership opportunities and roles for our Indian diaspora across both business and government and political life. So, um, Ted, uh, if I could ask you uh, the little bit about immigration policy, I mean, uh, there, uh, not specifically, but there have been often times when, you know, Indian professionals, students uh, have issues about immigration policy, um, you know, not being, being, uh, too rigid uh, and uh, uh, any anything that you have done or initiated towards uh, you know uh, addressing uh, the immigration policy as far as indians are concerned especially students professionals look i think uh, you know our immigration policy is is something that is always in flux it's not something set in stone and then it's forgotten so I know, for example, during the pandemic, there were committee meetings, they were changing these issues in terms of travel bans, in terms of exemptions. So much was changing in that immigration space. And I think that's important that it's always, it's always a living sort of policy space. But having said that, I think there is a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of 
uh, Australia obviously wanting international students to, particularly from India, to come to study here, to start a life here, but not necessarily providing any clear pathway in terms of post study, uh, how they can then contribute their skills, their knowledge, their expertise uh, into, into Australian society or even the bilateral relationship more broadly. So I think there does need to be a lot more work done in that space. Obviously, we have certain sorts of awards and you know, uh, you know, scholarships and those sorts of things. But I think that the pathway in terms of um, migration, in terms of settlement and all of that needs a lot more development here in Australia. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's ebbed and flowed over the years. We know that that Indian student cohort uh, are made up of really, a, you know, a really high level and, and that our Indian diaspora um, migrants are, are very high tax paying contributors to Australian society. So, you know, very important for our economic base is our Indian diaspora and their contribution. But I think at the student, um, at the student level, there needs to be more policy development in terms of a pathway for migration and, and permanent residency for those that may wish to pursue that. So you're saying a broader, uh, there should be, uh, you know, the broader immigration issue needs to be uh, addressed, uh, especially as far as students are concerned. Yes, yes. Any, any specific, um, uh, you know, uh, immigration policy related issue that uh, you would like to uh, sort of talk about uh, at this point? Because I do know that there is one category of students uh, who had, uh, you know, before the pandemic, their uh, uh, visas, which allowed them to st uh, sort of start with jobs uh, had got approved, but uh, you know, now they are facing a problem because the, the extension issue has not been addressed. So uh, any, anything specific you would like to mention, which has been done in, you know, with the perspective of the pandemic where many were outside the country and couldn't come back because of the travel ban and so on. Look, I think there's been a, a number of issues that have occurred throughout the pandemic. It's clearly, you know, um, been a reactionary policy approach because no government was prepared for yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and so this is where we need to learn lessons from, from what's occurred uh, this time. There needs to be some flexibility in terms of these sorts of um, visa uh, requirements and, and dates and all of those sorts of things provided. And I think that, you know, in terms of that, if, if flexibility is provided, then hopefully you know, we, we cannot be so rigid uh, going forward. And, and that only improves the way both countries view, view each other. Um, but, you know, I mean, I haven't had specific issues raised with me in, in this regard. The biggest issue that was raised with me during the pandemic was really from diaspora families whose children were in India and they wanted to be able to bring them home. So that's one of the advocacy areas I worked on to ensure that that exemption was added to uh, the Department of Home Affairs list for, you know, exemption for travel to India for those families that wanted to, to do that to, you know, to have their children. They were obviously very worried because a lot of grandparents were there and, you know, if they were to contract COVID, then that would have been detrimental in terms of, you know, for the family. And also it's about cultural understanding of the importance of family. You know, in terms of uh, of, it, of Indian families, we all know that, that 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 is a really important part of of Indian culture. Uh, you know, we always have family coming and staying with us and looking after children, and all of that is part of part of our family structure. So, you know, having the the policymakers understand some of those nuances, I think, is really important as well. Which comes back to the issues of India literacy. But yeah, I mean, I think this is a space which can continue to be worked upon. Uh, I would encourage um, Indian students or those with concerns about how they may have been treated or uh, you know, any even ideas they might have in that sort of policy space to share them with me. 
uh, I'm, I'm happy to play that conduit role between, you know, the interface of Indian students here in Australia and the and our Australian government, and see how we can ensure that we can improve and do things better. So, uh, any any uh, you know any Indians people of Indian origins in either in. Uh, you know, in politics, public life, or for that matter, even in other spaces, you know, um, scientists, authors, anybody who you would like to talk about, uh, you know, who you feel are doing very well and, you know, the world needs to know about them. Uh, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I think um, it's, not, it's not often that you see, you know, um, people of Indian origins going into going into roles in Australia, into sort of leadership roles, um, you know, for the first time, a bit like myself, I suppose, um, you know, that are that have something to contribute, but you know, have have never sort of had that opportunity to to be in that sort of leadership role. So one of the one of those people that uh, just last year, um, you know, started from humble beginnings. To become now the you know an Australian science leader, is uh, a distinguished professor. His name is um, Chenu Party Jagadish, and Professor Jagadish um, is is now uh, going to become starting this May, the president of Australia's uh, Academy of Science. You know this is the most esteemed uh, science academy in Australia. He is the very first of Indian heritage to take on this role. Uh, he, he, you know, he's he's such a humble man, uh, but has such a rich understanding and, and knowledge, particularly in the nanotechnology space. He's a pioneer in that space. Uh, he, I know, he's nurturing the next generation of of young scientists as all as well. Um, you know, and that again, he's creating a sense of hope for. A younger generation, perhaps also of Indian origin, like himself. Um, but very exciting to have Professor Jagadish, his expertise in the field, uh, you know, as a leading physicist, now going to head up uh, Australia's Academy of Science. Uh, right, we have actually written about him as well, you know, when, uh, oh. it, when the announcement uh, had, was made, though haven't yet really been able to interview him, but would like to do that at some point. So, you know, I am more or less done with my questions, but anything that you want to say, uh, you know, uh, that would be good, uh, which I may have missed, but you want to share uh, with our readers. I was just going to go back to um, the fact that, you know, as we said, this year is such a significant year for India, 75th year of independence. And today, if we look at both India and Australia, we are much more aligned with how we both see the world compared to 75 years ago, when, you know, we were both on opposite sides of the power blocks during the Cold War. And I think India's positioning to take an even stronger lead on regional and global issues, you know, commensurate with its political and economic power, will also encourage Australia to continue to engage with its, you know, with, with this sort of geostrategic and trade and investment and soft power issues. You know, this is what is a, a critical uh, moment uh, in, in both our countries. And, you know, I think that, sustain, that sustained momentum is what's needed so that nothing holds both of our nations back going forward. And ways we can do that, of course, are supporting each other on the global stage. So I know Australia is very much in support of India uh, having a permanent seat in a, in a um, reformed UN Security Council. Um, it was pleasing to see India chairing the UN Security Council in its last session. But similarly, Australia has been supportive of India joining APEC. I think you know, the ways we are working together through the Quad all of these different ways in both minilateral, multilateral forums shows so much alignment between both of our countries today compared to those 75 years ago. And, you know, I think this is incredibly important for peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific, but also because we are two countries that share so much in common, you know, obviously our, our vibrant democracies 
but also so much in a cultural sense when you look at the size of Australia's Indian diaspora. And I'm just look at, looking forward to playing, you know, a role in ensuring that momentum continues. Right. Um, you know, thanks so much. I mean, it was so nice talking to you. And I would request Sarah to please uh, share your official bio profile and some of these, uh, the photographs uh, which you mentioned. And of course, uh, we will try to, uh, from the recording, we'll also try to, uh, you know, pick out uh, bits so that we can embed 